Yes, yeah. I'm Dr. Henson. Okay. Um, let me know if there's any technical problems. Uh, let's just see here. Let me pull up the I figure. I've never used WebEx before. Let me just see if I can figure out how to pull up the chat box simultaneously. There we go. Okay, just in general about HPV stuff, um, you know, it's a popular topic on the ab site, mainly because there's a lot of anatomy and physiology questions they can ask that are not changing um, over the years. You know, things in general that are new and rapidly changing don't get asked on the ab site in all sort of subject areas, but in particular in uh, cancer areas. So the questions they like to ask, they love to ask questions about physiology and biochemistry of stuff that you think you know a lot about, like bile, um, but, you know, they're going to want to know, you know, how it's concentrated, what's it, what it's made of, et cetera. They love asking liver anatomy and, and related vascular questions. Um, they also like to ask questions about things that are actually relatively rare, like functional neuroendocrine tumors, um, liver masses that are uncommonly seen, mainly because the management of those is unchanging. Um, the cancer questions, the things that are changing rapidly in practice generally don't get ask, uh, asked about. If it's a complicated cancer, they're going to ask maybe about workup, but not necessarily about treatment. But if it's uncomplicated cancer, they may ask you specific treatment questions. So, like I said, we're going to try and go uh, pretty quickly through these, and I will circulate all of the explanation slides uh, that follows. I'll just give you, like, the quick two cents today, um, and then we can move on to try and cover as much ground as we can in the hour that we have. So um, without further ado, everybody man your, your keyboards, I guess, um, and, uh, and away we go. So um, the first question, uh, most accurate diagnostic test for Zollinger-Ellison syndrome, fasting serum gastrin, CT scan, endoscopy, secretin stim test. Okay, Ricardo Noble, he's all over it. Secret and stem test, exactly. So gastrin test is a good screening test. So hypergastrinemia uh, can go along with a lot of different things, and it's a good way to screen for ZES, but the confirmatory test is the secret and stem test. Um, keeping in mind, especially for people that have hypercalcemia, people that are on PPIs, they're all going to have hypergastrinemia. So you can't do the test while the person's on protonics. It needs to be stopped for several weeks beforehand. So again, don't bother taking notes on this. We'll send it around. Next question. So insulinomas usually require selective venous sampling, are more common in the head of the pancreas, are usually benign, treated with uh, anatomic surgery. All right, very good. We'll give credit to Deborah Lai on that one. Usually benign, very good. So insulinomas, you can do selective venous sampling for localization, but you really don't need it most of the time. They're pretty evenly distributed, even though we sort of traditionally think about, um, okay, annotation, whatever. Um, uh, da, 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 uh, more common in the head. Uh, no, that's not true. They're pretty evenly distributed. They are almost always benign, 90 plus percent of the time. Um, don't tell Steve Jobs. Uh, and many times, because they are benign, they don't need an anatomic pancreatectomy. They can be enucleated. Reason being, for non-malignant processes, you don't need the lymphadenectomy. You don't need all that additional marginal tissue that you would for an invasive cancer. That being said, sometimes you do need to do an anatomic pancreatectomy if the lesion is really close to the pancreatic ducts or the vasculature or something like that. So, okay. A lot of people are requesting to annotate. Um, uh, I don't know what that means, but you're going to move on. So, which of the following is the most common presenting uh, symptom in patients with a somatostatinoma? Who's got going here? See, any distension. All right, we'll give Ankit Patel, coliolithiasis. I thought we'd get a few people going for constipation, but yes, it's coliolithiasis, no question about it. So I'll go right along. What is the following is the cause of elevated serum gastrin of these choices? 
renal failure, insulinoma, islet cell hyperplasia, pancreatic hypertrophy after pancreatectomy. All right. Now, everybody ring in on this one very quickly. Yeah, this is a tougher question. So, remember I was saying there's a lot of sources that can cause hypergastronemia that may be not a gastronoma, and renal failure is definitely one of them. There's a couple of different pathways, but the most common one, uh, sort of the classic one, is in people with renal failure with secondary hyperparathyroidism, and they wind up with hypercalcemia and the resultant hypergastronemia. Okay, so recently diagnosed gastronoma, 50-year-old man noted to have a serum calcium of 12.5. Serum PTH is elevated. Although PPIs have been prescribed, the patient has persistent reflux symptoms. The next most appropriate step in management of this patient's reflux symptoms would be. So we've got a guy with a new gastronoma and an elevated serum calcium. Right, so just hammering on this same theme. Hypercalcemia, hypergastronemia go together. So this person probably has MEN1, right? So if we can prove that they have hyperparathyroidism, a subtotal parathyroidectomy or a total parathyroidectomy with autotransplantation uh, is the way to go. We'll give uh, Najiha Faruqi the credit on that one. All right, there are numerous tests of pancreatic exocrine function. Which of the following statements is true? Elevated serum amylase is specific for acute pancreatitis. The breath test, also known as the lung test, secret and test, and DMT test, all require duodenal intubation. Fecal fat test in a patient with chronic pancreatitis would suggest insufficiency and inadequacy of enzyme replacement. In chronic pancreatitis, pancreatic enzyme secretion is diminished in response to secretin. Looks like the consensus from a few people is C. That's the right answer. So, you know, when you're going through, uh, just as an editorial comment, these questions where, geez, I don't even know what the triolene breath test is, also known as the Lund test. Um, you know, I don't even know what the Lund test is. I know what the triolene breath test is. But when you're seeing these, you can get a little bent out of shape because some of the questions and answers might not be in your wheelhouse in terms of your knowledge base. But if you come through here, clearly answer C is true. So that can help you sort of narrow it down when they're talking about these esoteric uh, tests and questions that you might not see very often. 24-year-old man develops severe acute pancreatitis. Keep in mind also the absite likes to test on pancreatitis. That is part of the pathology. When we think about pancreas, many times we only study things like neuroendocrine tumors, adenocarcinoma, et cetera, et cetera. Pancreatitis is definitely fair game. So review those Ransom's criteria, review the terminology. 24-year-old man develops severe acute pancreatitis, secondary to alcohol abuse, 10 days after admission. He's febrile, white count of 17, CT, demonstrates peripancreatic edema and small bubbles. Proper management includes what? ERCP with stenting, percutaneous gastrostomy, FNA of the peripancreatic material, percutaneous drain placement in the area of the gas bubbles. So a little bit of... Dissension here, C, A, D, B, uh, I'm seeing just about everything. In this case, the correct answer is C. Um, all of these may become part of the patient's workup. All of these may be necessary in this particular patient. But right now, you're trying to figure out whether he has infected pancreatic necrosis or not, because that's going to drive your management. If this patient were septic and on the verge of death, uh, you may think about empirically treating him right away with putting a drain in. But in this case, they're telling you he's got a fever, he's got a white count, he's 10 days out. This smells like infected pancreatitis. But as we know, antibiotics are meant to be used judiciously in pancreatitis, so we want to establish the diagnosis. And we'll do that by a biopsy, or sorry, by a culturing the peripancreatic material. Okay, next question. Which of the following statements is true concerning Whipple procedure for carcinoma of the pancreas? Survival following pancreatic carcinoma is independent of margin and node status. The actuarial five-year survival for patients with resected pancreas cancer approaches 40%. Pancreatic fistula following resection is associated with mortality as high as 25%. 
An important factor in lowering postoperative mortality following Whipple procedure has been centralization of the procedure in high volume centers of excellence. So let's see. You got, I see a C, I see another C, I see a bunch of Ds. Um, in this case, D is the correct answer. Um, all of these are sort of approaching true, except for the first one. Um, survival clearly is dictated uh, on margin status and node status. Those are both highly prognostic. Um, the actuarial five-year survival does approach 40% but only for patients with stage 1A tumors on final pathology that complete a com uh, course of chemotherapy, whether neoadjuvant or adjuvant. Obviously, that only applies to a minority of patients. Um, Whipple's following pancreatic resection is associated with mortality. So it's about 10 to 15 percent if it's a clinically relevant fistula, so that number is too high. One of the reasons that number um, is lower is because of the centralization of these procedures at high volume centers uh, uh, that has lowered the mortality quite a bit. Uh, okay, so let's see here. Again, the notes will be there for you. Ooh, here's a good one. All the following inherited familial syndromes are associated with increased incidence of pancreatic endocrine, endocrine neoplasms, except, so this is one of those famous abcite except questions. So we've got von hippel lindau tuberous sclerosis, MEN1, poitz jaggers and neurofibromatosis. See a lot of Ds, one E, another E. Okay, so it's poitz jaggers is the correct answer, D. So all of the other ones are associated with neuroendocrine tumors. Um, poitz jaggers is you know, it's a tough one to remember, but all you need to put in your mind is adenocarcinomas of just about every organ with the lumen or um, anything that secretes anything. So um, the way to sort of sort out these things in your mind is maybe for the accept questions, start going down and saying, well, I know this one isn't, isn't, isn't. What are my last choices? So, you know, always pay attention. And I always used to sort of, um, you know, double click on the computer or highlight it back when it was on paper, which is a long time ago. Um, you know, whenever there's an accept question to make sure I know that it's an accept, because that's an easy trip up. Here's another one. All the following surgical procedures are appropriate for a patient who has a pseudocyst of the head of the pancreas, except cystoduodenostomy, cystogastrostomy, removal of the involved segment of the pancreas, simple external drainage. Mateo, that was a pretty big yawn. <laughs> right, so C. I see a lot of Cs coming through. A lot of different ways to manage pseudocysts. Point being, for patients with asymptomatic, um, I don't think this is in my explanation, but just to take a step back for a second. It is very common for patients to have what is now termed an acute fluid collection in the case of pancreatitis. So acute fluid collections are in the early stage, under four weeks, and they generally resolve on their own. Similarly, pseudocysts oftentimes resolve on their own, especially if they're under five centimeters. When do you actually do something for a pseudocyst? So just file this one away. When you do something for a pseudocyst, it should be large, prolonged, and by prolonged, I mean more than six weeks, enlarged being over five centimeters, or symptomatic. If it doesn't meet all those criteria, or at least two out of the three, you don't need to do anything for them other than observe, okay? But all these could be potential answers, except removing that part of the pancreas. Okay, I see the same group of people I was answering, so let's try and get some new folks in there. Which of the following statements regarding pancreatic anatomy is true? The majority of the pancreas is drained through the major papilla by the ductus santorinia. The minor papilla communicates with a small duct of versum, draining the inferior head and oncinate process. Nervous innervation arises from the superior mesenteric ganglia. Venous drainage is into the IVC. Heterotopic pancreas tissue has been identified in the stomach, duodenum, small bowel, meckles, diverticulum. I see some C's. I see some E's. All right. 
give uh, Brent Willoughby uh, correct credit for uh, E, which is the right answer. So if you look at the, I just want to go through this again. You know, this is a, a very standard sort of abcite thing and actually written boards as well. They're trying to figure out not only do you know um, the anatomy, but also can you work through a few things that are of clinical relevance. So what's wrong with A and B? They've got them backwards, right? So the ductive versum gives rise to the major papilla, and the ductus santorini is the minor papilla. The other thing to keep in mind, even though Versung starts with a W, uh, it's a German fellow, German anatomist, so pronounced like a V, and you can remember, if you recall, in embryology, the pancreas has a ventral and a dorsal bud that subsequently rotate around as the bowel rotates. So the ducta versung is the one that's on the ventral bud. Um, that's how I always remembered it. So nervous innervation, there's a couple people that put C, nervous innervation is via the SMA ganglion. Now, that sort of makes empiric sense, but just think about clinically what do we do for people with intractable pain from localized pancreatic cancer. They get a celiac plexus block, right? So, exactly, celiac plexus. So, the celiac plexus is where the pain fibers uh, uh, traverse to the pancreas. Venous drainage obviously goes via the portal system rather than the cava. And then, even if you don't know any of the first four answers, you certainly know Letter E is famously true, especially when you see the Meckles in there. Okay, 67-year-old male presents to your office with painless jaundice, Cavassier's sinus presence, and abdominal ultrasound is performed, followed by a CT scan. You suspect a neoplasm in the head of the pancreas. Which of the following CT scan findings does not rule out resectability? So does not rule it out. Encasement of the celiac. Dilated bile ducts, intra and extrapatic with engorged gallbladder. Confluence of the SMV in the portal vein is not patent. Evidence of extra pancreatic disease. Absence of a fat plane between the tumor and more than 180 degrees. Right. So this is a, uh, actually a pretty easy question because I don't know if anybody here uh, ever watched Sesame Street, but you know which one of these things is not like the other? So you've got four things talking about vascular problems, and you've got one thing talking about a bile duct. So that should raise a flag right there that unless that's an egregious answer, you should give it serious consideration as possibly being the answer. Of course, an engorged gallbladder is Cavassier's sign. Um, you know, some of this wording can be a little difficult um, because you may see or may have seen one of the surgeons at your institution resect somebody with an occluded SMV or portal vein. Um, you know, that that is done. Um, uh, you know, at appropriate centers um, by appropriate surgeons. But for the abcite purposes, you know, things that sound wrong probably are wrong. Patients that have that finding that do go to the operating room are the exception rather than the rule. So, like I said, think back to what you've seen clinically. Usually it'll lead you to the right answer. Uh, features of IPMNs include all of the following except, another except. Ah, Laura. <laughs> you know, the Applebee procedure, uh, it's a lousy restaurant and it's an even worse operation. Um, it's, uh, I don't know, if there's only a few places that do it. I wonder, are you at Columbia or Mayo Clinic? Uh, here we go. Okay, yeah, got it. All right. No, no, there's uh, very few and far between indications for an Applebee's procedure. The other thing, uh, you know, Applebee's procedure is actually originally designed for gastric cancer, uh, not for pancreatic cancer. Anyways, all right, we'll move on. Uh, IPMN, I see people already answering. They may be benign, premalignant, or malignant. If IPMN is resected and found to contain tubular variant adenocarcinoma, then the patient will have a more favorable outcome compared to non-IPMN adenocarcinoma. IPMN tumors can arise from either the main primary secondary ducts. Patients may experience one of the following, pancreatitis, pain, jaundice, mucin of stools. Classic presentation for this disease is the findings by upper endoscopy uh, of mucus emanating from the ampulla. So I see a lot of different answers here. E, 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 B, 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 E, E, B, E. Okay, so we're going to give credit to good old Randy Ryan there who got it right. The answer is B. Um, let's go through the other ones. Certainly, uh, they can be benign, malignant, pre-malignant. 
IPMNs can arise C from main primary uh, the main duct and, and branch ducts. Certainly D is is correct. So what they're talking about in E is you know the classic fish mouth appearance on endoscopy, which is the pathognomonic finding for main duct IPMN. Um, the the thing to learn uh, about letter B there is IPMNs can have I don't know if, yeah it's on this slide. IPMNs can be either tubular or colloid carcinomas, and the tubular variant essentially behaves just like every other pancreatic adenocarcinoma. The colloid variant actually has a more favorable prognosis, but the tubular, which is the majority, do just as poorly as everybody else with pancreas cancer. Uh, a 64-year-old woman has an incidentally noted 3-centimeter pancreatic cyst in the unsynthetic process of the pancreas. She is asymptomatic. The cyst is homogenous. No evidence of internal septations or organ invasion, and she's asymptomatic. Imaging reveals an enhancing nodule within the cyst. Which of the following statements is true? This lesion is more common in men than women. Benign cystic lesions of the pancreas are uncommon in women of this age. The patient should undergo a Whipple procedure since this type of cyst has significant malignant potential. The CT should be repeated in three months. The patient should undergo a cholecystectomy since gallstones are a risk factor. I see some Ds. I see some Bs. I see a C. Okay, so the, uh, the answer for this one is, in fact, C. Good job, Rodrigo Salas. Um, the key factor in this question stem they talk about all sorts of things that are really reassuring in general for a three centimeter pancreatic cyst, although it's getting a little bit worrisome based on size. All these other things are reassuring until you get to enhancing nodule. So an enhancing nodule uh, is one of those worrisome features that should prompt an intervention in somebody with an IPMN. So enhancing nodule, jaundice, main duct dilation, rapid enlargement, those are either what we call worrisome features or high-risk stigmata that should lead one to consider intervention, especially in an otherwise healthy, good surgical candidate. Okay, so explain there. All right, so moving on to some liver questions. They love the physiology and anatomy questions on the liver. So, which of the following statements concerning the hepatic acinus is correct? A, zone one hepatocytes are the first to regenerate. Bilirubin is absorbed primarily in zone two. Zone three hepatocytes are the furthest from the hepatic venules. Solutes that enter hepatocytes by diffusion are absorbed mainly in zone three. Sinusoidal endothelium is characterized by tight junctions with carrier proteins for facilitated diffusion. We'll give folks a few. Okay. So, in fact, C is correct. Um, I got the picture here that you can go through. If we could just go through our original thing. So, you know, it's going to be the other way around for the zone ones. And, you know, bilirubin is uh, soluble. And solutes that undergo uh, entry by simple diffusion also mainly absorb in zone one. And then the endothelium, remember, it's not tight junctions, it's loose junctions, right? There's that space of DISA, or DISA space, as they say, uh, you know, along those, um, uh, along those uh, hepatocytes that allow that simple diffusion and then facilitated diffusion as, um, as the blood flows along. All right, which of the following statements about the anatomy of the liver is true? Sadly, if you haven't learned the segmental anatomy of the liver, you, you do have to learn it. Uh, not just to make liver and pancreas surgeons like me happy, but they do love to ask these questions. So let's go through it one at a time. Which of the following is true? The liver is divided into the right and left lobes by Cantley's line. The sectoral anatomy of the liver is determined by distribution of the hepatic veins. The caudate lobe is a portion of the right lobe. The quadrate lobe is a portion of the medial sector of the left lobe. The segmental hepatic Anatomy is based mainly on portal venous branches. I'll give folks a few seconds to go through it there. See a couple of different answers, some C's, some A's, some B's. 
some E's. So in this case, it is B. Uh, let's just go through the before we go to the pictures. So Cantley's line, which overlies the IVC, uh, also rarely called the portal fissure, but uh, a little bit of an esoteric term there. But number one is definitely true. The sectoral anatomy is determined by the distribution of the hepatic veins. So let's see here. If I've got, I think I have it. Yeah. So the sectoral anatomy follows those three planes of the right, middle, and left veins. So when you hear about the left lateral sector or section, depending if you're European or American, and the right posterior and right anterior section, those are divided by the venous anatomy. However, the, sec the segment's anatomy is dictated by the portal branches. So the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight uh, is dictated by the portal branches. So just going back to our question here, number two, the sectoral anatomy is distributed by the veins. And then number five there, the segmental anatomy is based on the portal vein. So those are both true. The caudate lobe is not a portion of the right lobe, so that's the only one that's false. And the quadrate, or segments 4A and B, is the medial sector of the left lobe. Coming back here, there's that left medial section there. All right, so I think you probably already saw the answer to this, but let's go through it anyways. A 53-year-old female. So got to know that, that, just to harp on that again, you got to know that segmental and sectoral anatomy of the lobe. There's, there's questions on it. Yes, Randy, we were looking, uh, we were not looking for the false one. We were looking for the four true ones in that case. Um, everybody clear on that? Any other questions? I'll just take 10 seconds and pop them in the chat box. On liver anatomy. It's one of those things you just gotta, gotta go for it. All right. Sue wants to answer the question. Uh, 53 year old female presents with a synchronous colon cancer and hepatic oligometastases. A multidisciplinary GI oncology team recommends she begin systemic chemotherapy using Folfox. You review the images of the liver, you notice only one of the lesions would be amenable to percutaneous biopsy. You communicate with the team about your recommendations for biopsy of the following lesion. So it sounds like a cancer question, but really it's an anatomy question. So we got to think about this. A two centimeter lesion near the dome of segment seven. So Thinking about segment seven, since, like I said, I think everybody saw the answer already, let me just, we'll go through them one at a time. So segment seven is on the most posterior, most superior side. So on the dome there, a biopsy percutaneously would have to go transthoracic and potentially seed that tract. So A is probably not the right answer. A two-centimeter lesion within the parenchyma of segment six. So segment six is pretty easy. If you see segment six is on the right inferior most part of the liver, that's pretty much a chip shot for the interventional radiologist. So that's a pretty good candidate. Two centimeter lesion at the tip of segment three. Well, segment three is on the left side. It's very superficial, but it's overlying the stomach or even sometimes the transverse colon. So there's a chance for visceral injury. A two centimeter lesion in the caudate lobe. Well, that's going to be tough even if you're in the operating room, uh, unless you've got the liver mobilized much less percutaneously. And then lastly, a two centimeter lesion and the posterior aspect of segment five, well, the posterior aspect of segment five is going to be laying on the gallbladder. It's also going to be very close to the cava as well, much like the, the caudate lobe. So definitely the right answer is that two-centimeter lesion uh, in segment six. So moving on. Falsiform ligaments divides one and two, three and four, five and six, seven and eight. So uh, just to answer the question of Marissa, uh, is it important to know contraindications, relative contraindications to percutaneous biopsy of liver? I think it's good to know in general. Um, I think you're probably talking about uh, for patients with cholangiocarcinoma because percutaneous biopsy uh, will then preclude them from being considered for a transplant and sort of famously concede um, the biopsy tract, although that probably is less common than we think. Uh, so, yes, it's good to know, but will you be asked about it on the ab site? Probably not. Um, falsiform ligament, I see we got a lot of people with Bs in there. That is the correct answer. The ligamentum teres, or the round ligament of the liver, is the vestigial remains of the uh, what?
Yeah, B, 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 B. Okay, very good. So got to get those ones right. Sounds like everybody's got it. All right. Which of the following statements is our true regarding the anatomy and function of the portal vein? So we're looking for the statements that are true. It provides a minor part of the hepatic blood flow. It is the most posterior structure in the hepatoduodenal ligament. It is formed by the junction of the IMV and splenic vein. Its wall is hyperechoic on ultrasound. The right portal vein branches sooner than the left. So we've got to put all those together. Which one of those are true? I see some C's. I see some B's. I see a V. Um, I see an E. So D is the correct answer in this particular case. So let's go through them individually. Does it provide a minor part of the hepatic blood flow? Absolutely not. 75% of the blood flow by volume, 50% by partial pressure of oxygen. It is the most posterior structure in the hepatoduodenal ligament. That is clearly correct. Um, it is formed by the junction of the IMV and the splenic vein. I think this gave people a little bit of a um, some confusion because there was a lot of C's and B's in there. It is formed by the junction of the SMV and the splenic vein. Now, sometimes it's true that the IMV will insert right at that confluence as well, but the absence of the SMV from that answer tells you that it's clearly not correct. Its wall is hyperechoic on ultrasound. So this is important when you're doing an ultrasound of the liver. It's true because, remember, the portal pedicles, as they enter the liver containing the bile ducts, the arterial branches, the portal venous branches, they're invaginated into Glisson's capsule, and that Glisson's capsule is hyperechoic as opposed to the hepatic veins, which have no capsule and have no hyperechoic wall on ultrasound. So when you're looking at the liver under an ultrasound and the attending uh, or your senior resident says, oh, that's a portal vein, you think, how in the heck did they know that? That's why. Right portal vein does branch much more quickly than the left portal vein. Keep in mind this also applies to the bile ducts. The left bile duct is much longer in its extra hepatic course than the right bile duct, which enters and branches very quickly. So again, uh, you know, correct answer here is D. The right hepatic vein drains segment one only, segments two and three, segments five through eight, segment eight only. C, good, lots of C's, excellent. So just got to know that segmental anatomy. How much bile, this is a classic ab site, who cares question, but um, got to know it. So how much bile does a healthy adult produce every day? Good, a lot of people have already committed this one to memory. Lots of C's, yes, it can be up to a liter a day. It can be relevant for patients with a percutaneous biliary drain. Um, so you can know relatively how much is going out versus how much is passing antegrade into the bowels. Uh, but yeah, just got to commit that one to memory. Oops, sorry. Regarding the hepatic arterial supply, so we're looking for the true ones. One, parallels the portal vein intrahepatically. I think I just said that, so it must be true. Provides 70% of the blood flow to the liver. Normal anatomy is present in only 50% of individuals. The most important variations are a right hepatic artery and a common hepatic artery arising from the superior mesenteric trunk. The most common variant is the origin of the right hepatic artery from the GDA. So, which one of these are true? I see some A's, I see some B's, I see a C, another C, okay. So in this case, again, you know, like I said, one has to be true, right? Um, in terms of blood flow, we just said again, you know, it's a little bit of a tricky question here in terms of blood flow. Um, you know, by volume and by oxygen content, it's a little bit different. Normal anatomy present in only 50% of individuals. Well, we know that one's right. 
Um, norm, most important variations are right hepatic artery and a common hepatic artery arising in the, from the superior mesenteric trunk. Both of these can happen and both of them are important. It's a little poorly worded because usually we think about the most important ones being a replaced right, which is listed there, and a replaced left, which originates from the left gastric. So that one's not true. The most common variant is from the right hepatic artery from the GDA. No, that's not true. The most common right hepatic variant is from the SMA. So let's see here if I can. Oh, my box keeps popping up. So anyways, so there's all the explanations. We'll just keep moving on. So I want to talk briefly. This is one of my few lecture-like slides. Um, there's always a lot of confusion, and I get a lot of questions from our residents about how do you um, figure out what lesions are what on liver images. So this looks like a really busy slide, but it's actually not that busy. And then we're going to go through a few examples um, about how you would sort of go about thinking about this and apply it. So the first, when you see, when you get a liver cyst question, or sorry, a liver lesion question, the first thing to do is figure out whether it's cystic or solid. And if you have imaging, you know, it's easy on T2 to tell what's cystic or solid, but most of the time they'll just tell you in the question stem. We'll talk about the cystic lesions in a little bit, just thinking about presumably that it's a solid lesion. The first thing you want to do in your mind is think about arterial phase. So if they say it is hypoenhancing on the arterial phase, it's probably a MET. The exception to this is a neuroendocrine tumor, which are hyperenhancing, but I don't think they're going to get into that amount of detail on the ab site. Mostly, though, they want you to try and figure out between hemangiomas, HCCs, FNHs, and adenomas. So all of those are enhancing. So again, step one, solid lesion. Step two, is it hyperintense on arterial phase? So for hemangiomas, they are always going to have some variant or this exact phrase, peripheral nodular discontiguous enhancement. It's always going to be there in some way, shape, or form. Whenever you see those, it's a hemangioma, period. If you don't see that, and again, solid lesion, arterial enhancing, no nodular discontiguous enhancement, well, then you go to the next step, which is the venous phase. Does it wash out? Wash out is a big key word here. If it is hyperenhancing on arterial and washes out on venous, it's an HCC. You may also see the word pseudocapsule on the late phase. That is also an HCC. So there's four things that go into the LIRADS criteria. I don't know if they asked that on the app site or not, but arterial hyperenhancing, portal venous washout, presence of a pseudocapsule, and threshold growth is the fourth one that make up the LIRADS criteria. If you don't see washouts, then you're in FNH versus adenoma phase. So what you'll see with those is it's a solid lesion, arterial enhancement, and then on the venous phase, it becomes isointense or isoenhances with the remaining liver. That puts you in FNH or adenoma category. Sometimes they will make it easy and say there's a central scar, in which case you know that's sort of the buzzword to go bing FNH. Central scar, FNH, kind of like that peripheral nodular discontiguous enhancement is hemangioma. Central scar is sort of your buzzword for FNH. The other thing that they may tell you and that they like to ask is about sulfur colloid scans. Now, sulfur colloid scans are never done or very, very infrequently done anymore. But in abcite world, that's how you tell FNH versus adenomas. In 2021, um, actually, even like 2010, uh, what was done is a biliary contrast phase on the liver MRI. That's something called EOVIST or GATAVIST or PRIMAVIST. There's a, a couple of different uh, names for it depending on your institution. But point being, um, you know, the sulfur colloid scan is looking for Kupfer cells. The biliary phase thing is basically telling you, are you looking at a lesion that's made up of the normal components of liver parenchyma? If the, excuse me, if the answer is yes, you're looking at an FNH. If the answer is no, and you're looking at an adenomatous population only of hepatocytes, 
you'll have a negative uptake on the EOVIS scan. I don't think this is for the abscite, but I put it on there for completeness sake. The other pathognomonic thing for adenomas is that it will enhance very brightly on in-phase imaging because of the fat content. So let's just sort of think through this for a couple ones. So here we've got something, okay, I don't know if you can, can you see my pointer? Yeah, my mouse, okay. So, okay, we've got this very subtle lesion here on T2, certainly not bright, so it's not a cyst, right? So we've got a solid lesion. So the reason for the up to, again, FNH is really just a sclerotic lesion um, within the liver, almost like a scar in the liver, but it still has all of the classic cells present in the liver. So there's going to be disorganized, but still present, bile canaliculi. There's still going to be hepatocytes. There's still going to be vascular. So you will see uptake on the biliary scan. It's not so much that it's a bile lesion per se. It's just that there are bile-producing cells in FNH versus on, um, on uh, an adenoma, which does not have those biliary canaliculi with the Kupfer cells and uh, excretion of the EOVIST or GATAVIST or whatever your institution uses, it will be negative. So again, it's not, when I say it will have uptake on the biliary scan, it's not that FNH is a bile lesion. Okay, I don't want that to confuse you. Um, okay, so again, going back to in practice. So here's an MRI. Here's a T2 uh, phase. Here's the lesion. Pretty hard to see. Clearly not bright. It's not a cystic lesion. So you've got a solid lesion. All right, here's the arterial phase. Hyper-enhancing on arterial phase. Here's the portal venous phase. Hmm, kind of looks like the rest of the liver there. Now we've got our delayed biliary phase. So when we put this all together, again, solid lesion. Arterial enhancement, portal venous iso enhancement, no washout, right? And then no uptake on the delayed biliary scan puts us in adenoma territory. Let's look at another one. So here's the lesion over here. Just take my word for it. It's a solid lesion. I didn't put the T2 up. Here's sitting at the tip of the left lateral segment, left lateral sector, I should say. Here we've got nice uptake on the arterial scan. And now, aha, oh, on the portal venous scan, we've got pretty intense washout. And you can even see on the delayed phase, I don't know if you can appreciate it, and on the portal venous phase, there's a bit of a pseudocapsule there. So this is an HCC, but all you really need to know is arterial enhancement, portal venous washout, your mind should go right to HCC. Um, okay, so again, just to harp on a few more of these things. An isolated mass in the liver which has a central scar is most likely, right, everybody's central scar, B, 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 good, FNH. So here's an example um, of an FNH. You can see the central scar there. Here's a few of the other lesions just so you have a picture of them. What did I say about hemangiomas? Peripheral nodular discontiguous enhancement. This is what it looks like. If you see that, it's a hemangioma until proven otherwise. Um, and then here, again, solid lesions, arterial hypo enhancements. This is a CT scan rather than an MRI, but same kind of thing. These are METs. These are metastatic disease. Okay. Okay. Standard therapy for, what do we got on time? We got another 20 minutes? All right. Uh, standard therapy for a six centimeter right lobe adenoma is observation, embolism to prevent further growth, laparoscopic ablation, surgical resection. I see a couple A's, some D's, some C's, A's. Oh, we even got some analysis coming through. Very good. So, all right, so there's two things that we care about when it comes to adenomas. And again, these are all in the notes slides, so you need to write them down. But when you see an adenoma, you care about one, risk of cancer, which people have mentioned, and two, risk of rupture. So, especially for right lobe adenomas or anything that's peripheral, the risk of rupture is very real, and they do rupture and they do bleed. Um, I'm going to come back to some of the conversation that's going on in the chat box in a second. This is a little out of date. Anyways, so the size directly correlates with risk of rupture. 
Most liver surgeons would say anything exceeding five centimeters should be resected simply for risk of rupture. So five is the magic number for abscite purposes. In practice, even things that are under five that are close to the edge, you might consider resecting. In particular, you might consider resecting them in a woman who is about to or thinking about becoming pregnant because there is oftentimes threshold growth and rupture, which has an unacceptable risk of fetal loss. Now, the second thing you care about is risk of transformation to cancer. Risk of transformation to cancer is correlated with size, but the most important thing by far, by far, by far, by far, is the subtype of adenoma, okay? So the size actually has less to do with the risk of transformation. There are three subtypes. They're called the HNF1 alpha, inflammatory subtype, and beta catenin subtype. Almost all of the risk of cancer, regardless of size, is in the beta catenin subtype. The beta catenin subtype occurs almost exclusively in males. So hepatic adenomas in men should be resected, period, regardless of size. Okay? The risk of cancer is exceedingly high because the chance of it being a beta catenin subtype is exceedingly high. For females, Certainly, there is that risk of malignant transformation, but the more um, salient risk, because most of them are HNF1 alpha or inflammatory subtypes, is rupture and bleeding, and so size is more often the judgmental criteria uh, for those patients. So resection, resection, resection in this patient, and here's everything that I just said. Which of the following is true regarding the histology of HCC? The fibrolamellar variant has a better prognosis than standard HCC. Fibrolamellar variant occurs most commonly in the right lobe. It accounts for 10 to 20% of cases. Carcinosarcoma is more commonly metastatic than standard HCC and has a worse prognosis. Clear cell variant is confused with blah, 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 blah. Childhood HCC is most commonly unilateral. Okay, lots of A's. That is true. So just going through these things, fibrolamellar, generally occurs in younger patients, classically younger females, although it's not a very strong female pre preponderance. Uh, it does have a better prognosis because it's less likely to metastasize, but because it's um, often occurring in younger patients without cirrhosis, it can present fairly advanced. Um, classically, they're in the left lobe. Uh, carcinosarcoma actually um, has a little bit of a better prognosis as well. Clear cell variant is more commonly confused with clear cell renal cancer, renal cancer, not lung cancer, and childhood HCC is usually multifocal. Regarding hepatic hemangioma, it is the most common benign solid, so this is another one as we're looking for the true numbers. Most common benign solid liver tumor carries a slight risk of malignant degeneration. Most patients are asymptomatic, most common symptom jaundice, best diagnosed by biopsy. All right, so what do we got? We got a lot of A's. I would agree with you. It is the most common benign solid liver tumor. It does not turn into a cancer. Generally, they are asymptomatic. If they're going to cause symptoms, more commonly, it's the left side of hemangioma pushing on the GE junction or one that's so large it is causing pain just from mass effect. It is best diagnosed by looking for what again? Peripheral nodular discontinuous enhancement. Um, the other thing to keep in the back of your mind, a little bit of an esoteric one, but in folks with giant cavernous hemangiomas, they can cause thrombocytopenia due to consumption. That's called Casaback merritt syndrome. Patients with hemangiomas that are large should have their platelet counts checked. They oftentimes present with spontaneous bleeding. Anyways, okay. Uh, which of the following is true regarding FNH? It is usually asymptomatic. It has a central stellate scar. It is easy to differentiate from hepatic adenoma. May undergo malignant transformation. is clearly associated with oral contraceptive use. So, Whitney, I would say you absolutely should know that every male with an adenoma should have it resected. That's definitely fair game. Not sure if they'll bring, they, they may bring up uh, the subtypes sort of in passing, um, but I think the main thing you do have to know is that hepatic adenomas in males should be resected. So, oops, sorry. Um, 
What do we know about FNH? We know about the central stellate scar. Yes, they're often asymptomatic. They're difficult to differentiate from hepatic adenomas. They do not turn into cancers. The thing with contraceptives, there is a little bit of an association. It's not a particularly strong relative risk, uh, unlike adenomas. Generally speaking, when I see somebody with an FNH, if they are on oral contraceptives or steroids, I try to get them off. All right. What is the appropriate treatment for cholangiocarcinoma of the hepatic bifurcation? So a Klatskin or perihilar. So hepatic adenomas, rarely you can see some central necrosis that can mimic a scar, but they do not have that classic T1 dark, T2 bright central scar. Um, what is the appropriate treatment for cholangiocarcinoma of the hepatic bifurcation, a perihilar or Klatskin tumor? Right hepatic lobectomy, left hepatic lobectomy, Whipple procedure, bile duct resection, and partial hepatectomy, radiation therapy, bile duct stenting. CDs and E. So D is the answer. The important thing to know about perihilar tumors is that they are oftentimes unresectable, if not metastatic. Um, if you are able to resect them, the correct operation is an extended right hepatectomy or extended left hepatectomy, depending on what side the tumor is, and a complete bile duct excision. If you excise only the bile duct, you will invariably have a positive margin on the liver itself, almost exclusively. Um, also, you should give strong consideration to a concomitant caudate resection as well. So the key things here, bile duct resection, and the liver resection. That's what they're trying to get you to, to know. Not just the liver resection, not just the bile duct resection, both. And this is for perihilar cholangiocarcinoma. We're not talking about intrahepatic. We're not talking about extrahepatic. We're talking about perihilar or Klatskin tumor. All right. Best treatment for a 42-year-old patient with child's B cirrhosis in a single 4-centimeter HCC in segment 6 is RF ablation, segmental resection, right lobectomy, liver transplant. <laughs> so I think we've had one of everything, um, but yeah, this patient needs a new liver. Um, and why? You can actually stop reading when you get to child's B cirrhosis. Um, oh, well, that's not true. When you get to child's B cirrhosis, you know this patient's not going to be a candidate for resection and probably ain't going to be a candidate for ablation either. When you get to single four centimeter tumor, now you're talking about whether or not they're within Milan criteria. Now, different institutions use different criteria, but in absite world, the Milan criteria with regards to transplantation are the ones that count. So, again, here's one of my only sort of luxury slides. Uh, this is an area of a lot of consternation and confusion to the surgeons. Um, if you pull up, the best thing to look at is the Barcelona criteria, the BCLC algorithms, but those can get very confusing and very busy. So we're going to break it down into a really, really simple flow chart. So most patients with HCC on the ab site will have a single lesion. So if you're in that group and they have a single lesion, you want to know about their liver function. If they don't have cirrhosis or their child's A, early cirrhosis, and it is a small tumor, ablation is a uh, curative modality. If they have a large tumor and they have no cirrhosis or child's A, resection is the curative modality. Now, there is randomized data saying that ablation is equivalent to resection under 2 centimeters in size. There is less high-quality data for three centimeter lesion, I don't think they will screw you over on the ab site and say there's a 2.8 centimeter lesion, should you ablate or should you resect? Um, but suffice it to say, no cirrhosis or child day, especially child day five, you have all the options on the table. Resection for a big single tumor, ablation for a small single tumor. If the patient has advanced cirrhosis, child's B or C, and they're within Milan as this patient is, Transplant, Y90 sucks. Sorry, I didn't mean to say that, but um, 
they're not going to ask you to do Y90 on the app site. And in, if you were going to put it on this slide, you would put it under um, the same category as TACE. Uh, anyways, so child BC, not within Milan criteria, and you still want to do a local therapy, chemoembolization, or radioembolization, which is what Y90 that Elizabeth is, is asking, are options. If the patient has multifocal disease, multifocal disease that's not within Milan criteria, in other words, two or three nodules all less than three centimeters, that patient's not a candidate for transplantation, but they can get taste. Rarely we will do ablation as well, multifocal ablation, but you should not, should not, should not, should not be resecting multifocal HCC. For patients with extrahepatic or metastatic HCC, there's no role for local therapy to the liver, except in a palliative setting. For those patients, they should get chemotherapy, which serafinib is probably the right answer in an absite land. Um, I don't know if they'll ask you that, but this has just changed. A new randomized trial has changed our treatment paradigm to atezobevacizumab just in the last year. But point being, what do you care about? How many lesions? How big are they? And what's the liver function? And then plop it on this table. I tried to simplify it uh, for absite purposes. All right, so cholangiocarcinoma most um, uh, commonly occurs in the intrahepatic ducts, in the common hepatic duct at the bifurcation, at the junction of the hepatic and common bile ducts, and the distal common bile ducts. B, C, D, D, D. Yeah, so the correct answer is actually B. Perihylar tumors are most common. However, I find many surgical residents think the answer is C or D because those are the ones that we get to the operate on. Those are the ones that we do Whipple's on. So it seems like, from our standpoint, that the most common one is an extrahepatic cholangio, but it's actually perihylar. Remember what I said, that it's actually quite uncommon for those perihylars to come to resection uh, because of how much anatomy is there and how uh, frequently advanced the tumor is. Anyways, okay, after an uneventful, here's the other thing too, abscite lows, gallbladder complications. Um, after an uneventful lap, coli, oh, this isn't a complication, but suffice it to say, um, after an uneventful lap, coli, a 55-year-old male, path review demonstrates gallbladder carcinoma invading, but not penetrating the muscularis layer. What is the most appropriate next step in management? Lots of Bs, a few As. B, A, A, B, okay, so this is a T2 lesion, therefore the correct answer is in fact B. For T1A lesions, where there's no penetration beyond uh, the muscularis mucosa, mucosa, or lamina propria, no more treatment is needed, but for basically everything T1B and higher, um, the correct answer is to go back and do a regional lymphadenectomy and a segment 4B5 partial hepatectomy, thereby excising the cystic plate. Um, good? Good. In an otherwise healthy man with colorectal cancer and a two centimeter lesion metastatic to the liver, the treatment of choice is chemoembolization, cryoablation, resection, ethanol injection, RF ablation. C, 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 good, excellent. So, resection. So, colorectal mets most commonly spread to the liver. I will just comment on all these briefly. So, for chemoembolization, that's generally not a good treatment strategy for liver mets uh, of the colorectal variety. Uh, it can be done. And also, hepatic artery infusional pump therapy is a growing accepted practice for people with liver-only METs. But for this person with an isolated single MET, uh, especially of modest size, resection is the treatment of choice. With regards to ablation, so the other thing too, I would just say just from a, an examinship uh, uh, strategy, cryoablation, ethanol injection, RF ablation, those are all ablative modalities. So. When you see three of the same thing in a different way, you can probably say, well, one of those three is not the particularly correct one. It's probably something else. Anyways, from an ablation standpoint, ablation is considered less curative for colorectal liver mets. 
That being said, it can be done if it's somebody with multifocal disease or if you're trying to clear one lobe of the liver to allow a staged approach for somebody with multifocal metastatic disease. So there is a role for ablation in these patients, but it's for those with multiple sites of disease or people in whom you're trying to preserve parenchyma. Generally speaking, a pretty advanced uh, uh, patient in terms of management. So for this patient, though, in the absite um, vignettes, it's going to be a little bit more straightforward. In this case, it's clearly resection as the treatment of choice. Which of the following statements concerning hepatobiliary manifestations of ulcerative colitis is true? 70 to 80% of patients with UC have fatty infiltration of the liver. Liver failure is the leading cause of death in patients with UC. Bile duct carcinoma is a rare but possible complication of UC. Common bile duct occlusion from stones is the most common hepatobiliary complication of UC. Good. Lots of C's coming in there. So we know about that. Um, you know, patients do get fibrosis and even cirrhosis from ulcerative colitis, but it's actually pretty rare. Um, for patients with PSC, 70 to 80% of patients with PS, excuse me, PSC will be in the setting of ulcerative colitis. Um, and like anybody with PSC, they are at risk and do develop cholangiocarcinomas in general at a younger age. Regarding cholidocal cysts, mark the incorrect answer. Most common presentation in children is a right upper quadrant mass, jaundice, abdominal pain. Most common type of cholidocal cyst is confined to the extrahepatic biliary tree. Caroli's disease is dilation of the intra and extrahepatic biliary tree. Two types of cholidocal cysts, glandular and fibrotic. If not treated, they can progress to cholangio. Yeah, good, lots of C. So everybody knows that Caroli's disease, everybody's seen that page in Pfizer uh, with the chain of lakes up in the liver. So that's wrong because it's intrahepatic biliary tree for Caroli's disease. Good, I'll leave that there. Most appropriate treatment for a four centimeter hepatic abscess is antibiotics, aspiration, for culture and antibiotic therapy, percutaneous drainage and antibiotic therapy, operative exploit. Good. So C, everybody's got that. D is not wrong, but again, this is most appropriate for somebody with a four centimeter clear abscess, very drainable. The things that may change your mind is patients with multiple one centimeter abscesses or micro abscess. You know, those are patients where antibiotic therapy or occasionally tapping one just for culture and therapy, you may want to do. Um, but remember, that's long-term antibiotics, you know, IV antibiotics. The other thing, too, I just put on here, splenic abscesses are rare, but they're essentially the same treatment. Put, put it in your mind as being the same. Okay, which of the following statements characterize an amoebic abscess? I think we're almost done, and I think we're almost out of time. Patients tend to be older than those affected with a pyogenic abscess. Primary treatment is pharmacologic. The diagnosis may be based on serologic tests and resolution symptoms. Organisms most commonly reach the by the portal vein. Cultures are usually sterile. So what do we got here? Slowly coming in with some ease. Yep, remember amoebic abscesses. Those are the ones that are treated only with antibiotic metronidazole, and they also have that goofy sterile culture. Good. Uh, okay, a couple more. 45-year-old man is found to have a 600-year calcified cystic liver lesion containing daughter cysts. Daughter cysts being the buzzword. Potential treatments include everything but right hepatic lobectomy, cyst on roofing, evacuation, paracystectomy, marsupialization, a two-week course of metronidazole, aspiration, installation of scolocidal agent, and re-aspiration, albendazole. Right. Okay. C's, some D's, and A. So, yeah, this isn't everything but. So, sometimes you do need, so what are we talking about here? We're talking about hydata disease. Sometimes you do need to do a right hepatic lobectomy for hydata disease. Probably not for a six centimeter list, but it's a potential treatment. The unroofing paracystectomy, if you took this patient to the operating room, that's what you would do. For a six centimeter lesion, you would unroof and evacuate. Two-week course of metronidazole, what's that for? That's for, you know, we just saw it, amoebic liver disease, right? The standard of care really right now is what's called the PAIR treatment, P-A-I-R, percutaneous aspiration, installation, re-aspiration. 
which may take several treatment courses, but that is usually what's done for these smaller limited size lesions. Albendazole is the anti-helminthic agent along with praziquantel that these patients are put on. If you do take them to the operating room, remember you have to be very, very careful not to spill anything lest you uh, create an anaphylactic response. Oh yeah, I put a picture. Here's one I did last year, a very large one. Uh, many people have never seen these before. This patient uh, grew up in Macedonia, and what you see here on the right side of the screen, this is the pericystectomy, and these are what the daughter cysts look like, and that's what the liver looked like afterwards. Uh, I think we're probably out of time. I'm just about done. There's a few more here about gallstones and cholesterol stones and yada, yada, yada. I will send this to Virginia, and... Uh, she can circulate it so you'll have my notes on the explanations and everything. We got almost all the way through it. Good job. Thanks, everybody that participated. Uh, and we'll turn it over one minute late to Dr. Friedrich. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Kinsen. And I will pass out the uh, PowerPoint to you guys. Uh, next up.